Hello. Hello. <laughs> well, I'll have to end it. <laughs> Do I really? <laughs> <laughs> They're recording it. it it's, it's important to... Good evening and uh, welcome from home. And also welcome to the virtual event, Black Lives Matter, A Conversation. My name is Corey Williams and I'm the reference librarian here at the Fayetteville Public Library. During this program, our panel members will discuss the goals, purpose and evolution of the Black Lives Matter movement. During the first hour, the panelists will be discussing uh, amongst themselves. And then after that, in the next 30 minutes, we will be taking questions from those of you watching at home. In order to um, get your question considered, then you will just comment on the video that you're watching or use the hashtag FPL Black Lives Matter. We'll be monitoring those and getting the questions ready. We may not be able to answer every question that's asked tonight, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, towards the end of the program, we'll be putting up a link on the videos for feedback if you could fill those out, let us know your thoughts, any ideas that you might have for us, and we'll take a look. Also, a big thank you to Nate Walls of Secondhand Smoke Barbecue for providing our meal tonight for our panelists. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dequisha Prude-Wheeler, our moderator this evening, and she will handle the rest. Thank you, Dequisha. Thank you, Corey. As Corey said, my name is Dequisha Prude Wheeler, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a solo attorney in private practice here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, thank you all, the viewers at home and the panelists, for joining us today um, as we have this very important conversation about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the goal of this program is to enable a greater understanding and a clarity of diverse issues and experiences and concerns um, through this open dialogue that we'll have tonight. As a moderator, my goal is that everyone um, reach this greater understanding of the Black Lives Movement and the Black experience in general and be able to take something back to their respective circles and communities in order to orchestrate some change for us. Uh, we have four amazing panelists tonight, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves for us, and then also tell me if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? <laughs> and we'll start with you, Jared, over there. Uh, my name is Jared Carter. Um, I'm representing uh, Hands Up NWA, uh, one of the co-founders uh, here in Fayetteville. Um, our main goal is just to um, illuminate problems um, and solutions as well as resources and connect people uh, with them. Um, uh, we're kind of based out of the south side of Fayetteville, and uh, from there we plan to work our way uh, north. Um, but I, I do uh, enjoy the fact that you said, because um, by day I, I move furniture, I'm a, I'm a, I run a moving company, but I always say that um, when night comes, I put on my super, superhero cape, and uh, that's when I get to participate in the activism stuff. So. Um, yeah, that's that that is that is a I'll say a fun fun way to look at it. But yeah, yeah. thank you. 
Uh, my name is Tyra Jackson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a co-spokeswoman and I'm representing Black Student Caucus today. And what we are, we're a student founded and student led group of University of Arkansas students whose goal is to eradicate institutional, structural, and overt, covert racism at the University of Arkansas. Yeah. Oh, if I had a superpower, I don't know. I think it would be the knowledge to solve every problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am uh, Reed Benton. I am an associate professor of history and African and African American studies at the University of Arkansas. And my pronouns are she and her. And this is an existential question. I cannot <laughs> answer it right now. <laughs> I have to go think about what superpower um, I, I would, you know, like to have. Obviously, I would. Just like you, Jared, I'd like to dismantle all the things that I find reprehensible and that people in high you know, places tend to, you know, wring their hand about. But um, I'm not sure that that exists as a thing. OK, um, maybe we'll swing back to you at the end if yeah. you give us that superpower. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Olivia Patterson. I'm a sophomore at Haas Hall Academy in Rogers, and I think if I could have a superpower, I think it would be to make people see things that aren't there or to make things disappear that are there. Nice. And you have a business, right? Yes, art ma'am. Um, I do art. Um, my business is called Art by Olivia, and I just do all kinds of paintings. So Wonderful. Thank gotcha. you. And with that, we'll get right into <laughs> our panel discussion. Um, just to kick us off, i like for everyone to take a moment to just think about if someone who um, would approach you and said, I have no idea what the Black Lives Matter movement is, what would you tell them? What would your description of the Black Lives Matter movement be? Anybody can go first and it, it doesn't have to go in sequential order. <laughs> I would say an, an all-inclusive group however, focuses on black lives that brings attention to things that American society or even the society of the world does not readily see. So no one readily knows that, not in my personal life, that black lives are being attacked on the daily, not just in um, by police officers, but in medical fields, in classrooms, in everyday life, you know? So I think that's kind of the goal of black lives. And honestly, to unite uh, black people. I know that when I was young and when it first started, when the movement first began, I was in an environment where I was one of eight black girls every day of my life. And so I would see these Black Lives Matter movement um, posts on Instagram because, you know, I'm a young girl. And it would just it would make me feel in tune with my people. So that's what it means to me. If And that's what I would say to someone who came up to me and asked me what it was. Yeah. And I, I would, you know, following that uh, lead and describe Black Lives Matter as another instantiation of black people fighting against an unjust system. This is not new. <laughs> Since there have been system, systems of oppression um, as if existed in the United States. Black people have fought against them. And I know us in the West, uh, at some point, you know, we, the Enlightenment gave us the language with which to recognize humanity. Black people always knew that. Burning down plantations was their language of humanity. So Black Lives Matter is just another incarnation of the rebellions, of the Haitian Revolution, of, of uh, the Civil Rights Movement, of the Black Panther Party and the Black Power Movement. In every generation, black people has, you know, have had to find different ways of combating the kinds of institutional and systemic racism that exists in this society that is not by accident, is actually by design. This is how this country, by telling itself a lie, meant it to be. And so 
in every generation, because we have a hierarchy of race, different people, these young people here are no different from the people in SNCC. They found different methods and different responses but they're, in many ways, their responses are the same. So I see it as a new instantiation where black people, um, uh, um, this movement started by three black women who meant it to be an all-inclusive space for black people to have these kinds of con conversations about systemic and structural racism and to make it more expansive than just about black men, but about all black lives, black trans life, black uh, gay life, black women. Right? rather than to center, um, as usual, what we usually see as the discourse, black life meaning black men. So this is just the new um, instantiation of that. Want to add anything, Olivia? Um, I think she said that very well. I definitely agree that Black Lives Matter is really um, a movement that just highlights the injustice that black people have to experience every day. Um, I think that it is a movement that um, should be used to break down the systematic racism that has been around in America for centuries. So I think that's just, um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, it was all beautifully put. Um, I, I really can't add anything to that other just uh, say as a, in a recruiting uh, sense. Um, I think it's an opportunity um, where everyone can participate um, and everyone has an avenue um, and something that they can offer uh, to the movement. Um, <clears throat> and that's one thing that I've seen um, that's different than, than, than past. Um, and like she said, it, not, not just being focused on men, but being focused on everybody and then being inclusive and allowing other people to participate and, and provide, um, you know, uh, whatever, um, like I said, whatever gift or whatever they can, they can um, use to help the movement move forward, so. Thank you, Jared. So Tyra, you touched on a little bit earlier about kind of what the Black Lives Matter means to you personally. Would anybody else like to add on to kind of what it means to you to see this movement and be a part of this movement um, as black men and women? What does that mean to you? Um, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has really given me a voice because when I was younger, I didn't know about this movement. And now that I do, I now have the opportunity to use my voice and use my platform as a young person to just um, help spread a message that black lives not only matter, but that they are equal to everyone else's lives. I just, I see this movement literally as me standing on the shoulders of giants. I see all the people who have come before me, all my ancestors, and that's where I take courage and I carry them with me in my spirit. Because we must necessarily carry them forward, right, to use the, the energy that they use in their fight that allowed us to, that allows us to be here in this moment so i see what it means to me is that i am honoring a sacred duty this is my obligation they created a way for us and so it is my duty to create a way for those who will come after me um i I don't really. I can't. I said. I don't. I can't add to that. That that's that's beautifully put. Um, this is is a manifestation of of um, so much uh, pain and suffering, but also uh, I see uh, the love um, from people that have come before me, um, and it's you know kind of in that same regard. I want to pass that on and make things better for for my kids, you know, and and for what's coming in the future, so. Tyra, I don't mean to keep picking on you, but earlier you made a really good point that 
um, the Black Lives Matter movement is not just about police brutality and the criminal justice system. While that's a very important piece of it, that's not just what it's about. We're also fighting for um, fighting implicit bias and outright racism in all these other areas like housing, education, um, <clears throat> accessibility to healthy foods, all these other areas. Um, can you all speak to those experiences and if you've had any of those experiences in those um, spaces as black men and women? Um, one thing I will add, um, when, I, when you say that, what I think of, I suffer from um, chronic migraines. So I get a migraine, I'm debilitated for days, for weeks. And I think of my biggest thing as a black woman, health care for black women. We see Serena Williams, which is one of the, arguably the greatest athlete of all time, and one of the richest people in the world. And she almost died on the birthing bed. And um, I think of black women who have died from doctors not listening to their complaints. I think of when I've went to the hospital and I've said, oh, I, I just can't, I can't feel in me being overlooked as a black woman. We've seen studies done where doctors have literally admitted to not believing black women when they say they're in pain, not even believing women. So can you think of, think about what that means for black women? And so I know that I've experienced that in healthcare. And then as a student, um, I went from public to private school. In public school, you know, everybody is most of the time equal. You, you, you're a black student, you do this, you're a white student, you do this, you're an Asian student. But going to private school and automatically being underestimated, you know, especially coming from a public school, oh, you know this already? Or you've seen this already? And I'm like, yes, you know, like, mm -hmm. this is nothing new. This is just, this is my life. This is me. This is what comes with me. I'm, I'm an intelligent person and not in despite of my blackness. So I've seen it in healthcare and education in everyday life, you know, especially as a university student, being underestimated or telling, telling people, oh, I'm a, um, before I switched majors, I'm a biology major for pre-med. What, what kind of doctor do you want to be? You know, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and I see that every day. So that's one of the, other than police brutality, you know, yeah. Kind of going off of what um, Tyra said, I definitely agree. Coming from a public school and then going to a charter school, I've definitely seen like, um, like we'll walk in a store and my mom will see one of her friends and they're like catching up. And then my, my mom will say, oh, Olivia goes to Haas Hall and they act all surprised like they didn't expect me to be able to go there. And I see that a lot with teachers too, kind of underestimating my um, ability to be smart and retain knowledge because I am black. And um, one, I think one racist comment that I remember, well, I don't remember, but my, my parents have told me I was in preschool and um, this one girl said that she couldn't play with me because my skin was brown. So I think there's just a lot of that going on, like um, parents just kind of pass um, their prejudices and biases to their kids. So I think that's kind of where it all starts. As a parent, <clears throat> I experienced that yesterday um, with my daughter. Uh, she goes to School of Innovation uh, in Springdale, and then she, uh, you know, plays basketball at the public school. Uh, so uh, that's something that we've dealt with over, over the years. Um, the main thing that I see, uh, and just here locally, um, you have right down here on the south side where, um, you know, there's a food desert. Um, and it's something that's been mentioned and, you know, kind of, um, that was kind of just, huh, I didn't know that. And then kind of no one ever did anything about it. But I can remember going to Marvin's IGA down here on the south side and you had to pick, you know, the least brown uh, vegetable, you know, it's, it's kind of how you were doing with that. Um, and then now, now there's nothing there. So now you have, you know, single mothers, uh, single parents, you know, trying to uh, find a way with, you know, two kids um, to get down here to the store and, and before it was walking distance and now, you know, now you're, you're looking at two miles um, to the closest store and, and I mean, you know, things like that and but claiming a, a progressive area when that's something that that with the money in this area could be taken care of. Um, that I said the south side, I've just seen things 
being taken away from it year after year, four years. Um, the youth there, um, like the Boys and Girls Club, you know, it's over on Weddington as far as it not being over here um, like it used to be, uh, where the majority of the kids need it, um, live, um, that, it, that, that type of thing, um, I'll say is like one of the big issues I see, um, and not just here locally, but uh, going on across the country. I'll leave it to them. Okay. <laughs> so, so that kind of segues into the next kind of what Jared was going off of about how um, how does the Black Lives Matter movement in Northwest Arkansas compare to uh, the national conversation? And kind of a second part of that question is if it's not what you think it should be, what direction would you like to see the Black Lives Matter movement in this area go into? Um, I'm sorry to keep starting first, mm -hmm. but I think of, when I think of the Black Lives Matter movement up here, I feel like there's a complacency. I, I feel like the people in North uh, West Arkansas, and I, I only go to school here, I don't live here, but what I've noticed is they feel as if it's already a pretty liberal town. We have the university. Oh, we, um, I'm a Democrat. I, I believe in this, so I don't necessarily have to speak about Black Lives Matter because I'm not racist, you know, and I feel like that's the environment that I see every day. You know, no one, I follow a lot of um, popular and professional people in Fayetteville uh, on um, Facebook and they'll, they speak about it now that it's a trend, yeah. but it's all, their university is a pretty liberal school and no one's actually being overtly racist. Which university? <laughs> you said it. <laughs> so, I, I just wanted to sure. Yeah, that's the misconception <laughs> that the university is a liberal school. And so compared to the rest of the state, oh, compared to the rest of the state, it's a liberal school. It's a liberal place to be. So there is a complacency that we don't need to speak about Black Lives Matter because it's not really as demanding to us. It's not at our forefront compared to in Little Rock, where you see more deaths by police officers than you do up here. But it's still an issue. And so when you see the national level, there are cities that are um, making laws and making statements saying we're not going to allow this anymore. Like if you turn off your, and I think it's in Oregon or Colorado, if you turn off your body cam, you're already a suspect as a police officer because you've turned it off. But that's not being implemented here. It's not being talked about here. You know, now that it's a trend, it is. And so that's what I'm seeing with NWA. And it's, it's a disappointment as a, um, as a black person, but as a black student where the university contributes so much to the economy up here, but I'm not it's not as a issue. Race isn't as much as an issue. And so what I would like to see, what I think could help is implement more stuff into the economy with the food desert. See that that's a problem. If we're talking about it, what can we do about it? You know what I'm saying? Instead of doing symbolic things, and symbolic things do, they're, they're a factor. They're a major factor. But we need to get rid of the symbolism and the institutional right. things. And that's what I think should be should be on the forefront of, you know, NWA when it comes to Black Lives Matter. You, you've, oh. hit it, you've hit it really head on. Right? <laughs> um, I do agree that the, the symbolic stuff do matter, right? Because we have to walk around and, you know, take in what those symbols are saying and the values that they portray uh, and so on, but it's that harder work of undoing the systemic issue, you know, uh, racism and the structural racism that people tend to shy away from. It's like, yeah, we could have a conversation about this symbol or that symbol, or we will give you a T-shirt with Black Lives Matter on it. <laughs> and, you know, you know, even the library, we can have a conversation about Black Lives Matter. I want to know what you're doing to, in terms of action to get black kids more access to reading materials, to get um, more people hired, to get more black creatives and, and, and artists and literature people invited into this space. That has to necessarily accompany 
all the other symbolic stuff that is being done, or, or else it's just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in the bumping of gums. You know, it's time for us to move from rhetoric to action and to get into those spaces where people are doing work and to put that work into action. So if it's a case that we know that there, I mean, things with COVID going on right now in Northwest Arkansas, how, 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 how are we helping the people that are in duress especially those who are working in the meat, meat, pat, meat, meat packing um, industry. How, how are those people um, who might not be able to quarantine and do all of those kinds of things? How are we you know, trying to come together to help people like that, right? As he said, food deserts, right? How are we making sure that action is being done? How are we joining hands and heart with people down in the Delta to make sure that we're not isolating uh, and creating and maintaining this bubble up here in Northwest Arkansas. So all of that stuff, uh, now is not the time to mock what is going on with more rhetoric. And I come from a class of people that love to talk, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the academics and the intellectuals, right? So uh, we need to be linking up with the people, the activists on the ground actually doing this work so that we can actually do the work and to get into institutions of power to recreate and to create new grounds that um, can undo um, those past uh, injustices. Um, I saw, I read a book called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Mm -hmm. And in the book, she talked about, she's the psychologist that um, works on the institutionalism of racism in people. And she did a study on these students. And at the end of the study, when she, when they had all been like made aware of what racism really is, uh, there was a white straight male who said that um, he understood what racism is, but that he wasn't going to do anything about it because he knew that the system benefited him. And I feel that Northwest Arkansas as a predominantly white area, I feel like many of these people may have the same mindset, like why should I do something if I'm not being overtly racist, racist or if I'm not being affected by, per, uh, being affected directly by what's happening or even if the system benefits me. So I feel like that's really the mindset that a lot of people have here. So, And I just want to add to that just a real quickly. The white moderate who uh, Martin Luther King talks about, <laughs> they're <laughs> all in Fayetteville. <laughs> they're like, oh, we're good white people. We're the good ones, right? Like, you know, it's we're not racist, right? And um, we've been doing our series of talks at the university where we've been looking at the new research. Uh, Abraham Kendi's book that I'll be teaching in my African and African American Studies class in the fall, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He says there's no such thing as not racist. It's either you're racist or you're anti-racist. And so racists uphold the institutions um, and the systemic um, injustices, right, that maligns um, people and non-racists support and push and advocate, put in action for those system that supports equity for, uh, for oppressed people. So there's no, okay, well, I just don't have the racism gene in me, and so that is okay. What are you actually doing in terms of your action? And so um, that's what Martin Luther King was talking about, how he was being maligned back in the civil rights movement by the white moderate who was like, wait, no, now is not the convenient time for you to be doing what you're doing. Wait till, you know, uh, a better and a more appropriate time. Lukewarm acceptance from the white moderate. Mm -hmm. I think that's very problematic. Point. That's a good point both you and Olivia touched on that um, people, non-black people don't know how to be an ally. And I think uh, the word that's floating around now, like the buzz word, is performative. So some people don't want to act because they're afraid of being what they're doing, whatever they're doing, being labeled as performative. Like, what do you say to those people who want to be an ally but are afraid of acting and it being taken as 
not as serious and, and maybe that it's just performative? How, what do you tell those people that want to be an ally? I don't, I don't even, I don't like the word ally. I want co-conspirators. <laughs> Come on, you with me? You rolling? What you doing? You know, uh, co-conspirators, accomplices. You know, because ally allow people to stand in that space of non-action. And I think um, if you look back to the case of when um, Bree Newsom climbed up on that pole in South Carolina to take down the flag mm -hmm. way before this recent action when the football player was like, I ain't playing until Mississippi take off that racist flag, right? Uh -huh. He had a white guy there and the police came. They taught Bree because it's important to center, right? Black people in that discussion. They taught Bree how to climb that, that pole to take down the flag. And then the police came and they're like, five oh you know? And uh, the police was like, how are we going to get her down? They were about to tase the pole. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. Homeboy was like, touch the pole because they knew that they wouldn't tase him. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, no. Don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was my alarm. Um, but he put his hand on the pole. And that's what Ally do. You, you give up something. You have skin in the game. Yeah. You put something on the line because you know you're standing on morality and you're standing on justice. So moving away from allyship into accomplices and co-conspirators, because that's the kind of action this is going to require. I've seen, and what you said was completely amazing, and it just makes me think, I have a friend and he's in a fraternity and we know, and, um, not a predominantly black one, and we uh, we know that these fraternities can be can can add to the racism that we see. And what she's saying, he, I've noticed that people don't want to jeopardize their everyday life. They don't want to uproot their lives. They don't want to lose their friends. They don't want to seem like they're giving too much. You just care a little bit too much. You know what I'm saying? And he sacrificed his fraternity he sacrificed his friendships and when his white when his white frat brother was like was saying stuff that was racist he put that on the line he said it's unacceptable and lately we've been seeing online where people lose their jobs they lose their livelihoods for promoting for saying things that are racist and he put that out there of his frat brother his frat brother said something racist he blasted it on social media that's what you need to be doing you know, you need to be putting your livelihood on the line. You need to be putting your reputation on the line, just like we put our lives on the line every every time we lo leave the house. Every time we walk outside, our life is on the line. So losing your friendships, losing the way people look at you is much less than me losing my life over the color of my skin. And I think that's what people, allies, need to be ready to do, you know. It's not performative. It's not too much if you're protecting me in my life because my life is just as important as yours. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, allies just, uh, the first thing they need to do is listen. Um, and, and that can, you know, kind of go, for, you know, fall into place from there. Um, I've just, uh, over the years, I've, seen so many instances where um, they either deter the movement or uh, get in the way. Um, so that, I, you know, first thing they need to do is listen. Uh, they have to remove uh, the feelings and the tears uh, and, and be uh, open uh, and, and, and able to uh, not necessarily stand in, in our shoes, but just uh, allowing us our truth um and i i mean i don't i don't have a, a you know a good way to you know explain that but just allowing us our truth it, it just means um you know not uh standing in the way or deflecting um from uh what the goal is um and what we've lived and why we want to change and why there's a movement 
So what about those people who say, I want to be an ally or a co-conspirator, um, but I don't like that term, black lives matter. I feel like all lives matter because black lives matter excludes certain people. Um, how do you get someone to understand what Black Lives Matter actually means in that scenario? So, so at this point, I feel like um, there are enough metaphors and uh, enough people um, that analogies. Y yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, at this point, if you don't, if understand, Jesus you don't said, want to. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I don't know that you can be an ally if, like, if you're still on that. You know what I mean? Like, there, if, if. That, that's one of the things by, that I was talking about, getting out of the way and removing those, those tears and feelings, because that's what that is. It's I'm not being mentioned in this sentence, and mm -hmm. I need to be mentioned. That, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, but that, I mean, that's how I feel yeah. about it, but anyway. Yeah. I think it's not, when we're saying Black Lives Matter, it's not, we're not saying all lives don't matter. Obviously, everyone's life has value, but we're saying that Black Lives are the lives that are being put in jeopardy right now. We are the lives that are being targeted. So therefore we need other people to out, we need other, not ally to, um, what's the word you use? Co-conspirator. Yeah. Co <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need people to, yeah, we need accomplices to come together and support us so that um, our lives aren't being targeted and aren't being put in jeopardy anymore. We aren't saying that all lives that only black lives matter, but we're saying that black lives matter too. Black lives are equal. Um, an analogy, or well, I guess I shouldn't say that, but um, a way that my dad put it is he always, um, he said that when there was slavery that the white people were up here and the black people were down here, meaning that we were being owned, we were under the control of the white people. And then when they abolished slavery, we just moved over here. Now they don't own us, but our lives still have less value than theirs. And so Black Lives Matter means that yeah. our lives are up here with the white life. And But I think that a problem with that is people think that when the black lives start to have more value, then the white life starts to have less value, but that's not really the case. But I feel like that's how people see it and why people are trying to say that all lives matter. And it goes back to what Olivia said earlier with not wanting to lose the privilege that you already have. When you, when you admit that there is a problem, that black lives don't actually matter, then you stand the chance of losing that, that say-so, losing that height that you have. And ultimately, it's, it's not even a black and white thing. It's a selfish thing. Right. Where, where does it say, or why is it that you have to put somebody else down to maintain your value you, as a person? You know what I'm saying? And you see that through history with classism, racism, sexism. You know, we have to step on somebody else's back so I can get up at just as high. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it, it goes back to what Olivia said before with, I don't want to lose my privilege. I don't want to lose the standing that I have. And if, and if I say that your life has value, then I lose my own value. You know what I'm saying? So what you said was on the money. <laughs> but that's the, founding, that's the founding lie of America. In order to, this country was created in the paradox of freedom mm. and slavery. Exterminated Native Americans colonized their lands looted African bodies. Mm -hmm. And to justify it, to make the money that you were getting, you had to say, they're not men. Mm -hmm. You had to tell yourself a lie. Mm -hmm. And it's in that space of that lie that we exist, that now you're like, well, I can't admit that black lives don't matter because the whole, where I'm from, in Jamaica, they would say the whole Dolly house would fall down. <laughs> the whole, the, the house of cards would fall down. If we would admit to that, that founding lie that we've told ourselves, all men are created equal while you have slaves. Right, mm -hmm. right. And now people are saying that clearly, <laughs> look, people 
people over here don't have equal schools. You go to Springdale, <laughs> there's one school with largely Hispanic people, and then there's a other school with rich white people. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you not see this? And you want me to participate in that lie with you, like I don't have <laughs> sense in my head. You see it. Like, you, you want to tell a racist joke, and then when I don't laugh, you act like I'm the curmudgeon. Right. <laughs> no doubt about it. You know? But white people's kind of unearned confidence in their own opinions about these kinds of things, to me, is just breathtaking. You know? <laughs> to, to all the analogies of Jesus went after the, the lost sheep because he believed that one was hurt. All of the analogies that we've seen, the one house that is on fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not all houses matter because only one is on fire. We've seen all of that. So to my mind, thinking otherwise is to embrace a kind of specious reasoning, if not outright intellectual fraud. Yeah. You know? So we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the mostly white people who rebut against this kinds of stuff have a difficulty extending um, things that are basic understanding, right? And basic laws of how human beings interact. How, why do they have a difficulty extending that to black people, right? Um, and, and it's because in this country, again, from the very beginning, you're taught in this country that if you're white, everything belongs to you, and you have to be center. You have to be front and center, and you have a right to everything. So you have to be black lives. No, but I'm also in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not about you right now, Karen. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, 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 it, to me, it's intellectual fraud. And it's willful blindness. Mm -hmm. So I don't even entertain those kinds of questions. Yeah. You know, because at this point, you're just being willfully blind. So, yeah, with, like I said, with that being said, like, of course you have those conversations and there's a reason for those analogies. Like there's somebody out there that didn't understand. But uh, as far as coming into you wanting to be an ally, you got, you know, some uh, therapy and things you need to go through at that <laughs> point. Because um, you can't come into this space with that, like I'll say, as far as in, into the Black Lives Matter space. Because that's, that's a filibuster is in, in our when you come into a meeting with that and we're trying to get something done and then we have to explain something to you that really you already know, you know, honestly. Um, <laughs> and we spend 10 minutes on that, 15 minutes on that, and we're meeting for an hour and a half, you know, that's, that, that deters the movement. So, yeah. I, and it's the kind of racism, that's what it does. It yeah. wastes your time. Mm -hmm. Oh, black people don't have a history. Now you have to go. Oh, I was going to be an engineer, but now I have to go research this to show you mm -hmm. <laughs> that this does, in fact, exist. It's foolishness. Well, do you think that black people have a duty to teach? No! no. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no. You get all the good schools in the country, and then black people should have all this emotional labor to teach you also while they are having to deal with what they're seeing happening? And there's a, there's a, there's a, a it's ally a nah. role um, there. Uh, there's an ally role. Um, if white people aren't racist and if they, um, you know, understand these things, then they can spend time uh, doing that. Um, but I don't I don't have time. For Educating it. their fellow. Right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. what's going on out here is too urgent. Um, people are dying, like you said, in police brutality and otherwise. Um, and it's 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 too urgent for for our time to be taken uh, doing that, uh, especially on a consistent basis. Especially, like I said, all lives matter. This you know this it's been six years going on since Mike Brown. You know what I mean? So for real, you know. <laughs> like, come on. Real. Yeah. 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 I I mean, we see people educating themselves. Why should I educate you? Right. You have black authors who have been writing books since, since we've been facing this. We, there's been writings saying that we shouldn't be facing this. How to be anti-racist, um, which is what Dr. Ben said. Uh, why are all the black kids sitting together in the lunchroom? 
um, the letters from Birmingham, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, we, we have these writings that have been telling you for centuries that what's going on isn't, isn't you know, isn't right. Educate yourself on it. We're li we live in the age of technology. You can go Google books right now by a black author telling you about their life and the way, but not even about their life, of the systems that are in place mm -hmm. to keep black people back. So I shouldn't have to spend my time or a meeting educating you on something you should come already in knowing. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. that's why we don't have time for it. Especially, it's getting detrimental. It's getting to the point where I'm afraid. Everybody is afraid of leaving their house, of not even leaving their house because Brianna Taylor was killed in her house. Mm -hmm. You know, and she wasn't at fault. They were in the wrong house. So it, there's no time for it anymore. There never was any time for it, but it's definitely not no more, you know. Mm. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about the movement is that um, you have to be a teacher to get people to be a co-conspirator or um, an ally, but also the all lives matter bit. So can you all touch on some of the other misconceptions about the movement? I know um, a lot of people equate it to uh, a hate group. They say it's a hate group, or it's like the Black Panthers, the modern day Black Panthers, by saying that's also a hate group. So can you? <laughs> what's wrong with it being the modern day Black Panthers? Well, they they say that the they like Black breakfast. Panthers was a hate group as well. So that's why they equate the two to one another and say they're both hate groups. This is just the modern day Black Panthers. What? How do you debunk those misconceptions? Can I first off say that the Black Panthers group was not a hate group? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like. Please. Oh Lord, what are, you see things right now that the Black Panthers created in your everyday life. Free lunch at school, that's the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Health care for women, that's the Black Panthers. Do, do your research. You, that just really hit me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I don't, I can't understand how it is a great hate group if we're not doing stuff that's anti-white. If we're focusing on black lives, that's not inherently anti-white. And that's what some people believe. And the thing about it is, people say you're not advocating for white people. There have been many times where white people have faced police brutality and we've had say their name. We've had movements, we've had protests. You're not advocating for white right. people. We're talking about police brutality. And while the majority of people who face it are black, it, it's coming to the point where everybody's facing it for speaking out. So just like we're doing that, you can do that. It's not a hate group because we're not preaching kill the white man so the black life can be better. As a matter of fact, we're preaching equity. Can we be on the same level as the white man? Can we be considered like that? And so when you come and you say it's a hate group, it's just not even consistent. There was no lynchings. The uh, Ku Klux Klan, we're not lynching white people. We're not killing. I can't think of a, I can't recollect a time where there was a Black Lives Matter um, activist who killed a white person for being white. So it's just, it's a fallacy. And it's another way to deter the true problems. I think it's because sometimes born out of guilt, out of what white people have done, that People cannot conceive of a black movement that does not want revenge. Mm -hmm. And it was the same. It's like, it's, <laughs> think about this. As historians, I have to draw our, our, our minds back to the fact that we move from black power to black lives matter, please believe us. Come on. <laughs> and a basic statement. Right? And even back in the day, right, people were like, oh, black power, it's maybe like white power. And so even though the Black Panther Party was doing all of those kinds of things in terms of um, the, the issue of policing and housing reform and jobs and education and prison reform and land and bread and all the things that, you know, they stated that they wanted and the Black, um, black Lives Matter movement is doing a lot of the same things. but. Thinking about it 
how we can reorganize our system by uh, or, or, or think about alternative ways in which we can exist, expanding our moral universe. And that's that's the problem, I think, um, that, that issue that people lack imagination. And they think that black lives matter means only black lives and black power means um, it's the opposite of, uh, of white power. So they're going to also burn crosses and things like that. You know, this is white fear and all of that stuff talking, which is just really a distraction. Um, when you when you have yet to be liberated, you you probably have a very uh, or a lot more vivid imagination than than the, than the, the oppressor. But um, I like I said, like we were just talking about um, with the with the all lives matter thing. I I think it you know um, people choose to see what they want to, um, and <clears throat> with the, you know in that regard, I. Um, kind of just, I, I put my focus elsewhere um, as far as uh, that goes um, because, um, I mean, honestly, I think when we when we sit down and look at it, people have everything in front of them that they need uh, to 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 make the right choices and the right decisions to see. Uh, what Black Lives Matter does, um, what it, the goals are, um, uh, and even going back to the Panther, they, they can they can they can see what what it accomplished. Um, they can see, um, you know, how uh, it was it was taken apart and who took it apart, um, if they choose to. So um, all the resources are there, um, and, but what I won't do is waste my breath. Uh, <laughs> when I could be doing something else um, to further the movement, and like I said, people, people, everything is there in front of them if if they want to 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 see um, and be on the right side of history. So I mean, it's it's a choice, but it's it's definitely it, it, like I said, everything's in front of them if they if they want to know um, what what Black Lives Matter is about um, and what the groups. Um, uh, like you said, the, the, the shoulders that we're standing on, uh, what they were about. Tyra, you mentioned something in your response to that question about equity. I think uh, a hard conception for people to understand when you, talk, when you say black lives matter just as much is the equity versus equality thing. They say, oh, we, we fought for equality, you, everything we want, everything, everything to be equal. Can you kind of explain that difference? What does it mean to be equitable versus equal? I have an analogy for it because it is kind of a a hard thing to explain for the layman. If I come in the room and I don't have the opportunity that you do, you have to boost me on a level to where I'm, okay, let me see. I'm at a baseball game and I can't see. You need a board about this side to see over the fence. I need a board about this side to see over the fence provide everyone with what they need to be able to see the game, to play the game. Equal is when we all have the same box. We may all have the same box, but I still can't see over the fence. But when I got the box that fits me, I'm good, you good, we, you know, we, we're all good, you know what I'm saying? And that's where the equity lies. You know, blacks, black, young black kids, they have not, they don't have the there's a deficiency in their reading. They need more to be able to get on the same level as the white kids who have, who are already on an eighth grade reading level. You know what I'm saying? So provide them with tutors, provide them with books, whereas only a white kid would only need the book. That's what, uh, that's what equity means when comparing it to equality. I'm gonna, um, so I just read this article um, the other day that blew my mind. And I know the picture that you're talking about, right? The, the image that is routinely used to explain this idea of equality versus equity in terms of you could equally give all of us water, right? And it's like, well, I've been in desert for 40 days. <laughs> I think I need more water, right? <laughs> um, but that whole analogy of the stand-in and the, the shortest boy needing more, mm -hmm. 
um, the article suggested how that image is rooted in a kind of white supremacist thinking, right? In terms of, it's suggesting that that shortest boy, something is inherently wrong with him. When, you know, it's the ground under him that is unequal. It's rotted. Right? So it's not necessarily that his size means that he's inherently, um, you know, the problematic and, you know, just like how they think that black people or Latinx people, they're just sucking up the government resources and they need more because they're not contributing. It's the unequal system and the structure that is causing that. So may, we need to get rid of the boxes and something under the ground it's needs to be, yeah. <laughs> 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 needs to shift in order to, for us to really grasp the systemic nature that has created the inequities. Nothing more to be said. I <laughs> well, Dr. Ben, I know you are really a sort of a historian. Um, so what advice can you give to um, educators of predominantly white or non-black populations to help them to understand what Black Lives Matter means and what the movement means in a way that'll encourage the students um, and help them to want to make change? Um, so as a historian, um, you know, we tend to say that the past is prologue. We have to understand the past, right? That the idea is that history very much set the context for our present, right? And so um, I think I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we could think about the what happened, the Black Panther Party, Black Power Movement in the 60s, and now we have Black Lives Matter, right? We could look at those movements founded out of concerns back then, same issues, policing, housing, jobs, education, land, peace, bread that they outline. Right, um, trying to self-organize um, at the community level, but also um, those earlier movements um, also rejecting key concepts of capitalism, which uh, stages the kinds of hierarchies that creates the inequities in our society. Right, um, uh, and those movements also stressing the need for African Americans to defend themselves. Now, um, Black Lives Matter is the vanguard of this 21st century. Right when April Tometi and Patrice Colors and Alicia Garza um, created this movement in 2013 after the killing of uh, Trayvon Martin, right? They create this to allow these kinds of conversations about anti-black racism, about state-sanctioned violence, um, and as black women, as I mentioned earlier, they wanted the movement to decenter men and to create a space for the whole black people. Right. Um, so obviously, uh, this was happening. If we think back then, this was happening in the context of a discussion about um, America being a post-racial society. Are we? Are we going on? Mm -mm, time? No. Okay. America being a, a post-racial society because we had a black president. <laughs> right. My president is black. My Lambo is blue. Um, <laughs> uh, and so um, black people were, were being told that racism is over. Right, and there was, you know, we fought the great fight, and they would reference the Civil War, and they would reference civil rights, and Obama, you know, Martin Luther King led us to the promised land and gave us Obama, and why are you guys still mad? <laughs> what is wrong with you guys, right? So now if black people don't have their rights, whose fault is that? That was the question that was being posed at that time, right? If it's, it's because um, they're not doing the things that they need to do as a people in order to rise. So we saw the kinds of pathologizing of blackness um, during that time in which black victims were being blamed um, for the condi uh, conditions of their suffering, um, as opposed to the systems being able, um, being told to transform, right? Um, and the, the, not just the economic system, but also the social system, the media that uphold these kinds of ideas about blackness and so on. And so um, just like those earlier movements, we see the, the black power, the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, speaking to that system and the set of contradictions, uh, uh, raising them to address them and to deal in with them, but also to expand our imagination and our moral universe beyond the current mythology 
that we tell ourselves, right? And to experiment also with alternative ways of being and alternative ways of living, right? So we don't, we're not beholden to the system, like other systems um, existed, right? So uh, that has produced, um, you know, um, um, this rupture. And so educators have a key role to play, right? Um, uh, educators starting uh, um, as, you know, from kindergarten, and um, all the way up through high school, right, must reimagine how they uh, are, re you know, rethink the ways in which they talk about history. Whose mm -hmm. history do you center? Whose mm -hmm. history do you tell? Uh, Chinua Achebe says, until lions have their own historians, the tale of the hunt will glorify the hunter, right? So history is written by the conquerors. Right, um, like uh, you, you, you take an American history course, and all you hear about great white men, right? Um, Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton, and all of this. Like, well, were black women there? What did they think? <laughs> People were allowed to have thoughts back then, right? Um, so we're now seeing those kinds of um, writing being done, right, mm -hmm. from below. The history being done by you know people looking at early Native American empires, right? Uh, and you know people call them Native Americans. They existed before America, <laughs> right? The Iroquois, the Cherokee, all of those people existed before they they existed before this country was formed. So that was kind of a misnomer. But <laughs> so people are talking about all of these. So educators have to find a way to rethink what they've been telling. And for me, as an educator myself, the biggest challenge I have in my classroom is getting students to unlearn things that they've been taught. You know, it's like, oh, well, Thomas Jefferson raped his slaves. And like, no, don't talk about our God that way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so people have to really, you know, um, their primary sources that are accessible online you know, um, that talk about how Washington chased down um, his, his slaves across different lines as they run away. There are all kinds of things available, slave narratives. Here um, you can access databases with slave narratives and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's up to educators who have the will and can organize, you know, themselves in conferences and so on to share resources and materials to rethink what they have been taught themselves and what they're sharing with students. I think that um, we're getting ready to wrap up here in a second and go to the uh, Q&A from social media. But I want to um, ask you, Olivia, this last question. It kind of segues from the education piece. Um, if you watch the videos and look at all the photos um, from many of the recent protests and the movements, they're being led by young people. So what can adults do to support the youth in uh, in this time and help them to, to be as active as they can be? Um, kind of going off of what Dr. Banton said, I think one thing that um, that adults can do is really educate young people, educate their children. Um, when their children are growing up, make sure that they're not, um, I feel uh, there's a another thing that I saw in, um, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Um, she talked about this example where she was in a store with her black, she was black and her son was black and they were in the store and they passed this white lady and her white daughter and the white daughter was like, oh mommy, why is he, or why is their skin different? And the mom just, she was like, shh. And she didn't really answer the question. So I think that, um, so white white kids are not, their questions about black experiences are not really being answered. They're being taught to be silenced and to just not ask those questions. So I think adults really need to um, educate, um, educate the young people, uh, spread awareness and things like that, and just really answer those questions that they have so that everyone can just be aware and know what's really going on. Anybody else want to add on to that? I would say, and listen as well, when you get to a certain age, you know, college students, we often have people who are older, professors or whatever, saying, well, you need to be, you know, it's a, it's a process, or, you know, it's not cut and dry. And sometimes it is cut and dry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, we're the generation that has to take over this. 
We're the ones who will be leading the next generation. We have to deal with climate change. We have to deal with police brutality. So it should be, it's coming to a time where you need to listen to us. You, in one point, you want to say we're kids, but then on the other point, we're grown-ups, you know. And so there's no, there's not, there's no balance between that. You just give us the reins or move out of the way. You know, and that's kind of what it's coming to at this point when you reach a certain age group. And it does, like Olivia said, it starts from the bottom. You know, you need to educate your kids. And then when they get older, when you say they're an adult now, that's when you need to listen. Because eventually me and Olivia will have to take over this. And there's no there's no position to be to be in the way. Uh, you and Olivia, y'all, y'all there. Um, <laughs> and I, I agree with with both of you uh, as far as at home, uh, and it has to start from a young age. And I think I know from from our perspective in our community, uh, we just have to make our our youth aware uh, of, of who they are, uh, of where they came from, uh, how much more they are uh, than slavery, uh, how much more they are. Uh, than, than oppression and how much more they have to offer. Um, a story that my stepmom tells <coughs> uh, Dr. Johnson, or Johnson Carter over at uh, in the College of Education here, but uh, she she talks about um, when you know being in an all white class uh, as a, in, a, in, a, in a girls school, so you know all white class uh, of girls, and um, you know her making a ninety, I think she made a ninety six or ninety four on her paper. And um, all, you know, she looked at it, and then the girl behind her looked at it, and before she knew it, you know, they had passed her paper around the class, all these white kids. And, you know, she's thinking in her head, yeah, I can't believe it, I didn't make 100 either. That's what they were thinking, I can't believe she scored higher than all of us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but she knew there was nothing wrong with her. Even when all those other people were thinking and looking and passing her, she knew that there was nothing wrong with her, and I think that that's, that's something that we have to instill and our kids from jump is like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. And, you know, when, when you know your history and you know uh, uh, how beautiful you are and what you have to offer, um, it's a lot easier um, to, to stand up uh, and fight back for, for, for equality and for what you know is yours. Wow. Well, I think that's a great note to end our discussion on. Um, you guys have been amazing. I don't want to end it, but we have to get to the Q&A that's on um, social media. So what will happen is they'll read the questions from the mic over there um, to us over okay. here. Okay. okay. We've had quite a few questions. Um, one of them actually specifically for Jared. Uh, they said, I'd be curious to hear from Jared to know about what a black activist should do. And I'm assuming they mean in the community. I guess how can they be involved? What should they be doing to kind of move forward? Um, and, and we kind of already touched on this earlier, but just uh, in the way that I've see, you know, that the, that the movement has changed uh, here recently and even back from past movements, um, I, you know, there are so many different avenues for people to participate in uh, at this day and age. Um, you know, we, we see an artwork uh, here locally. Um, it, uh, your boy, the baby, you know, he had, he, you know, he had his new, his new cut. Um, there's one I particularly like called Burn. That's got David Banner and Saha the Prince, so, you know, in the music avenue, but the arts are doing their thing. Uh, there's some people that just sit back and, and, and put money in hands of these organizations and put money in the hands of these young people uh, that are already out here doing their thing. Um, the biggest uh, thing I would say um, is just make sure uh, I know every time that, that, that a new, I'll say it every year or a couple of years, a new wave starts and people get that fire to go out and be an activist and do something. The biggest thing that I can, I can recommend is just find out what's already available, uh, whether it be in your area or, you know, a lot of times people, we start off and we want to, you know, start up. You don't have to start from scratch all the time is what I'm getting at. A lot of times there are people uh, and maybe it's only four or five people in your community that are already doing it, but at least you don't have to start uh, by yourself and start uh, from, you know, from ground zero. Um, but that's the biggest thing I would say is um, 
be open and willing to to unite and attach yourself uh, and, and certainly listen and learn from other activists um, and even uh, not necessarily being an ally, but when you're uh, going into, I'll say another, uh, uh, like an area, be, be cognizant of what those people want. Um, it can't be, when I go into the South Side, I wanna do something that's gonna be beneficial for everyone or, or beneficial to the South Side itself and not just for me as a resident or for me as a business owner down there. So, I mean, those things um, is, is what I would say. I can't specifically, you know, say, hey, this is what you should be doing as an activist because everyone has their own part. Well, what can I do specifically to support your group, Hands Up NWA, because it's like a grassroots movement, right? What can they do specifically to support you and your organization? Um, with, with us, uh, we partner with a lot of uh, groups here in uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we partner with Nate and, and Secondhand Smoke, um, with, with Lighthouse Solutions, um, and Ms. Keisha Harper uh, over at uh, Mighty by Design Therapeutic Art Studio. Um, how I roll, and I'll just be honest with you, hands up NWA is, is, is two people, and it's been the same two people um, for, for kind of from jump. Um, but like I said, there are, our, our goals um, can, be, can, be, can be advocated for. Uh, we're here for the youth. Uh, that's our main focus. And like I said, to, to make sure, you know, like, you know, our, the South Side is, is kind of our first priority because um, it seemed like everyone's throwing them away. But uh, to make sure that, you know, like I said, we, we, we need, y'all just built ONF up here, you know, but we, they, need, they still need food down there. Uh, so right now, that's kind of, kind of where we're at. Um, uh, we, we need programs for, for the young people down there. Uh, y'all know the housing situation down there um, and what they're doing. So that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're at. So. Uh, what we're doing is 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 seeing what we can do uh, the the legal way through our local government uh, to 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 get those things changed. But um, just as far as support, uh, if you want to support us, you can contact me on Facebook. Contact Hands Up NWA on Facebook, um, you know, and you can donate to us and that type of thing. Um, but um, really, we we would like for people to, like I said, find find your avenue. And, and and just dig in, get get your hands dirty. Yeah. All right, thank you. We had let's see. There was another question. This one came up quite a bit. Was about um, why is there no official Black Lives Matter chapter in Arkansas? Um, I don't know if that's correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that <laughs> is fun. Okay. That <laughs> we had a banner up um, a couple of years ago. Um, that, that ain't them. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh that was yeah that was yeah. that okay. was those guys if someone's wanting to maybe connect with the local chapter is there a way for them to do that um uh, they can reach out to me um i i um we we work with several you know several chapters across the country um and whether we go under the name or not i guess is is you know irrelevant to us but i uh, like I said, if they're needed, I had somebody message me about contacting Black Lives Matter. I didn't know what they wanted, you know, um, but yeah, if they can message, they can message hands up NWA on Facebook and, and speak with, with Tina or myself okay. uh, if they're looking to get involved here locally. All right, thank you, Jared. Um, another one, this was a rather long one. Some of them were. Um, this one said, what do you say to people who say that we shouldn't destroy the statues or histories of people who made big strides for our country because they owned slaves, stating they were doing what was normal for the time and were a product of their generation? <clears throat> what was normal for the time is not necessarily what is right. Um, but it wasn't normal. Let's, let's, let's stick that pin first. From Jump Street, it's like, <laughs> it's the, the same thing that we suggested earlier that in order for you to make that statement, you must be considering black people as not people. 
because they were resisting and they were protesting and they were saying that this was this is not normal we don't like it we want to be free so it was not normal and even so white people during that time opposed it the debates around what to include in the constitution thomas jefferson himself even though he owned 600 slaves all men are created equal <laughs> you, it was not normal. The, the, what, the consternation he had about slavery. <laughs> the Continental Congress, when they met for that, they had to exclude that to appease Southerners at the Continental Congress. Um, the, 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 the paragraphs he had in there about slavery. Great Britain said, how is it that we hear the largest yelps for liberty from the enslavers of black men. <laughs> it was not normal. So I would really like to disabuse people of that idea. It was not normal at all. Black people were telling you in no uncertain term, if burning down your house and slitting your throat is not evidence enough that they don't want this, we don't like it. I don't know what else. So it was never normal. Not to mention the many intellectual debates among people at that time about the evils of slavery. So it was never normal. So excuse me, because I didn't even think about that. <laughs> one, just because one group of people think it's OK does not necessarily mean that it is OK. And I think me and Dr. Bannon spoke on this. Symbolism can go a long way. If I walk on campus, and I see a statue in the name of a college, the college that I am in, of a man who signed the Southern Manifesto, who was OK with segregation. I don't care what else he did. He may have promoted, you know, he may have changed his views. But at one point, this was he his view. It. It, yeah. And, and that's the, that's the idea that people say, yeah, you never apologized. And you say, well, he has the scholarship. And the scholarship is huge. And you know, it contributes to this and this and that. But what I feel, I have to go to this university, too. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. Those statues add on to what already exists. There is, in the Mississippi flag, before they decided they were going to change it, in the right corner, there's the Confederate flag. And then they have the uh, lines going through. What does that say? What does Mississippi support, then? You support that? That's OK for you? You only care about what one group of people want? That's why those statues need to be torn down. You don't even know those people. You know, this is part of your heritage. What heritage? It's also part of black people's heritage. heritage. And black people are like, we don't want it. Because those enslavers, the Confederacy, who were raping black women, we are the ancestors also. And black people who are the ancestors are saying, tear them down. So what you're trying to tell me is that my voice is, it does not matter as much. But you can tell a lot about people by what they're able to look past. Oh, we're able to look past Fulbright being a Dixocrat because some rich people gave us some money. <laughs> Stop the hang ringing and just tell us you want the money. <laughs> right. My life is less important than the money, than the $4 million. You don't care about whether students are feeling comfortable on campus. You don't even care about what I'm teaching in the class. Like, you hired me to teach them critical thinking and to ask them to question stuff. And you're over here doing mental gymnastics. <laughs> about, it, 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 as Will Ferrell would say, it bottles the mind. <laughs> Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. All right. Let's see. This one it says, when it comes to defunding the police and reappropriating these funds into communities, what sort of new programs do you all think we could create in society that would help push, more, push towards a more equal platform for all races? Um, I think that we need to have programs that help black men specifically that have that are in jail because I know that um, our prison systems are biased to 
get black men in jail and keep them there for much longer than any white person would be left in jail. And so I think we need programs that really that will really help and ad advocate for them to help um, get them out of jail and um, more programs to help them find jobs so that they can support themselves and their families after they get out of jail would be a good place to put the money. Yeah, that's a good one. And look at the, the things that are already here. Jared has hands up NWA. Move that money from what a system that you're using to police black people to a system that promotes black people. Mm -hmm. it, it's about deconstructing the system that we have. If Jared, who lives here, has lived here, says that there's a food desert, why are we trying to promote something that continuously doesn't do anything except for kill, kill people who shouldn't even be dead? It doesn't matter if I did something wrong or not. Giving up someone's life or losing a life is never equal to anything else. You know, promote the stuff that we already have. You know, put programs in the things that we need. You talk about the youth and how the youth are, you know, inherently bad or bad and stuff. Well, why not make a program that that helps the youth instead of policing the youth? You know, that's that's when it comes. Do the opposite of what you're doing. Right. You know. <laughs> Well, you can see what, you know, from the defunding movements in places like New York and in L.A., where uh, the homeless population alone in L.A., right, that they're going to be putting that money into housing. So it's the same thing, just like Jared said, that there are housing issues down in South Fayetteville. Why not create? That's a basic necessity of human beings. Create housing, food, and shelter, right? creating those kinds of necessities so that people don't have to commit crimes of poverty. Right. Eliminating, you release people from slavery into the chains of poverty. So eliminating the kinds of issues that lead people to commit crimes of poverty is where those kinds of funding can be channeled to. And I want to say that it's not something that's far-fetched or ostentatious. Finland has just got rid of homelessness. They've, they've done it. Homelessness doesn't exist anymore. They've created a set of houses that if they see someone who's homeless, they put that in them house and get them on the right track with therapy and stuff that can lead to them being or contributing to life, contributing to the pursuit of happiness that we have. And it's less expensive than the system that they had in place. This, this is things that can be done. Defunding the police why do we need the police? <laughs> I mean, like, to be honest, you know, if, if we're creating a system where there's, there's no need for police, then it's, it's obsolete. And then we'd have to question the whole system. It's like, what kind of system creates this need to police certain categories of people? What, what does, what, who does it serve? Right? What could you say the correlation is from modern day police to slave watchers back in the day? <laughs> Overseer, <laughs> officer. <laughs> this is the KRS one? I know I'm old. <laughs> That's it. Overseer, <laughs> overseer, overseer, officer. overseer, overseer. If you say it really fast, it turns into officer. That's how the song goes. Mm -hmm. So um, I've done talks before to police officers where I've traced the history of the emergence of um, the system of policing, right, to, to um, the plantation, right, because that fear of black people rising up and proclaiming their humanity, you have to install people there to keep those people under subjection right. so that they don't rise up and kill you in your bed at night. And the, and the way it ties into the, to the prison system as well um, and kind of just, you know, how you have a modern day slavery system um, that is alive and well and, and still working. That are being used um, free labor to create um, goods and services for that Walmart sells. <laughs> what was that in that goods, goods that, that Walmart and other, you know, companies uh, that you know, benefit. Sells. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not just license plates anymore. <laughs> Okay, and then there's one, we'll just, we really only have time for one last question. 
and then we'll have some closing thoughts. But this one's actually for Olivia. Um, this one says, public art and how it has become a focus of how to concentrate the movement, ownership, and power has been central to the movement of late. He says, as a young artist yourself, how do you think art history will remember this time? And I think this one could also be opened up after Olivia. Um, let me think about that for a second. I mean, art is just really a central language for all people. I mean, art is something that anyone can really understand. And um, I think that, wait, can you repeat the question? I'll make sure I want to respond to what they're actually asking. Public art and how it has become a focus of how to concentrate the movement, ownership, and power have been essential to the Black Lives Matter movement as of late. OK. How do you think art history, art history will remember this time? Well, I hope they remember in the future that this time will be remembered as a time of freedom and um, just removing systems that have been set in place over centuries. And I think that a lot that it's really been focused on promoting black art and black businesses because in the in the past, obviously, it, America is predominantly white, and so obviously people shop at predominantly white owned corporations and things like that and a lot of black businesses because um, America is set up to just oppress the black community. I feel a lot of black businesses are small businesses. So I feel like um, by supporting black businesses, we'll really be able to um, um, we'll just be able to spread our culture, which will help spread awareness, and it will just help us to um, really just be more equal by having our media and our culture consumed at the same rate as white culture and white media. With our with our ownership with it, because they do right. consume our they culture. They consume. That's all they consume. <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> but they don't put our name on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, well, any closing thoughts? Um, just want to tell everyone, you can get on change.org and sign petitions. There's all kinds of petitions, and it literally takes 30 seconds. You just put in your name in your email, and, like, if you, it's optional. You can put, like, a note of why you're signing the petition or what it means to you, but there's hundreds and thousands of petitions on there that you can sign. Um, there's one, there's justice for Breonna Taylor arresting their, arresting the police that killed her because they still haven't been arrested. Um, there's other ones just for defunding the police in general and promoting black business and taking down laws that have been put in place to just, um, benefit the white community. So there's all kinds of petitions that you can do on there. And literally, it's just one click sign. So after you put in your name and email, you can just, it gives you a list of petitions, and you can just click the ones you want to sign. Um, I just want to say invest in the movement. Um, invest in knowledge. Um, and, and like Dr. Ben said, um, the you know, history. Is 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 so important uh, to understanding uh, the current situation. Uh, I mean, just you know, you can start with anything. Start with uh, some of the books that we mentioned. Start with the Willie Lynch letter. Start with uh, something. Um, but um, just get 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 your hands dirty um, and get involved um, and and be be a co-conspirator. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, the movement, uh, it's it's not gonna rest. Uh, but we're not going back. No. Nope. Yeah, we, we we're not going back. So yeah, that's so what? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Going off of what he said, you can if you don't like reading, you can even go on Netflix. They have a Black Lives Matter collection with lots of documentaries that um, were helpful to me. I got on there and I watched, uh, I'd recommend 13th. It's about the 13th yeah. Amendment yeah. in prison systems. And that was really eye-opening. 
and they have lots of other good ones, Malcolm X, who killed Malcolm X um, when they see us. So there's a bunch of good ones on there that you can use to educate yourself if you don't like reading. And question everything. I think Dr. Bannon has really not only opened a lot of the um, eyes of who's watching, but us in general. I know me. I still, me being an activist, I still think in the perspective of the white man. You know what I'm saying? I still think in the perspective of white history. When there's my people, why shouldn't I think in the history of my people? What was okay for one group was not necessarily okay for another one. Mm -hmm. So question your beliefs, question your thoughts. You see that you think a statue is okay because some people say it's okay, but it's not okay for me. And I, and honestly, my people built this country, you know, and both of my people, native, native people, African American people, I mean Africans, we built this country. So why do I think in the perspective of the white man? I've been taught in history class and I haven't even, I've been brainwashed myself. So question everything that you see, I would say. That's my closing remark. Yeah. yeah, and I think just to add to that, you know, just like us as women can uphold systems of patriarchy, right? Black people also internalize racism. Right, we have that internal white policeman that lives in our minds. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, why should I be concerned what a white person is gonna think? What a white person think is of no consequence to me. It's none of my business. It's none of my business, <laughs> really. You know, but we have that internal policeman, right? Um, you know, can I wear this? Are they gonna think I'm scholarly enough? You know, uh, do I look like a professor? You know, things like that, that you, you know, you have that internal policeman. And you have to check that policeman often. You know, Toni Morrison talks about getting rid of that policeman. Like, oh, do I have to write my book in a way that white people can? No, I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to black people, <laughs> you know? So um, I just wanted to say that we too, as black people, we have to get rid of those kinds of ways in which we uphold white supremacy within our communities and within our lives. But um, this movement is going to continue. Like we said, there's no going back. Since the beginning of this country where there has been oppression, people everywhere have found a way to protest, right? And as we see, this protest is global and it has always been global. Since 1829, right, when David Walker wrote that scathing letter to colored people across the world, but especially to African Americans where he condemned slavery in no uncertain terms, right? Um, Black people have long had a global understanding of, of suffering and have long sought to partner with people wherever they're oppressed. From the anti-colonial movements in Africa and Asia, right, by black people here in America thinking of themselves as colonized people too, right, and reaching out to other people as well, to the movement in Palestine, Right, uh, the Black Panther Party had coalitions with uh, Chicano workers working in fruit uh, um, fruit picking industries in in California. Right, um, Frederick Douglass uh, went to Ireland and raised a lot of his money in Ireland and Scotland um, um, in his journey. Right, um, Mar Marcus Garvey, his, the, the UNIA had chapters in Australia, Cuba. How many places in the world, right? So think about ways in which, um, you know, we can come together as, as people, right? Um, to see our condition um, and to see, the, uh, see that in other people's condition because there's certain oppression that we do sanction ourselves. We okay the bombing of people over there. We don't bat two eyes about what's going on. We think that is okay, and we find a way to legitimize and to okay that narrative. So in our own movements and in standing up for ourselves, we have to remember that history, that long history of forming those coalition and siding with similarly oppressed people everywhere that they exist in this world, right? That's how we've extended our mor moral universe and our imagination to create new systems, right? Um, so to get us out of our current conditions. 
So I'd just like to thank our panelists. I, you guys have been so great. I've learned so much from you all, and I hope that everybody that was watching at home learned something they could take away and, and take back into their communities and, and make a difference somewhere. I want to thank the Fayetteville Public Library for giving us this platform. Uh, the organizers of this event, Stacy Mitchell, Diana Dominguez, and Corey Williams. Um, and as, last, last but not least, I want to thank our viewers for uh, tuning in with us tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so much. You. thank, thank you. all of you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>